Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. The Knicks fall 125 to 111 to the Indiana Pacers, a mixed bag in the debuts of Bojan Bogdanovic and Alec Burks. We get into it all right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. We want to remind you, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day because we're with you five days a week or when the Knicks make a big trade. We're with you 12 times a week. Somewhere in the middle of those two is most realistic. Uh, he's Alex Wolf, editor-in-chief of The Strickland. Uh, you can check out all their work on all forms of social media at the Strick.land. I'm Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster and because I forgot to do it earlier. I wanted to mention you can subscribe on YouTube and hit that notifications bell to ensure you never miss an episode and then do the same on the audio side of things by hitting that auto download function. Alex, a little bit of a disappointing debut for uh, the brothers Bogdanovich and Burks, uh, the Airbnb team. If either of them could jump, that'd be a cool nickname, but unfortunately they can't. Uh, There's the Knicks fall to the Pacers, 125 to 111, with the obvious caveat that the Knicks are still missing uh, three crucial pieces in Mitchell Robinson, OG Ananobi, and Julius Randle. Uh, Spirited effort from the Knicks in the first half down by just three, but eventually Indiana runs away with this one. Uh, Certainly the most interesting thing to talk about, though, is those two new guys. How do you think they did? Yeah, I I actually got to see this in person, which was cool. I had a cool seat. So my wife got me for Christmas. So shout out to my wife. Uh, They were right behind like Radio Row. So I think Wally was on the radio call in this game, sitting like eight feet from Wally Zerbiak. That was kind of fun. Did you like um, razz him at all? Or, or no, I resisted the urge. I resisted the urge. I wanted to be like, hey, man, you're like the fourth best commentator on the Knicks. Or, you know, whatever. <laughs> this is the garden, Wally. Nowhere <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got to see these guys in person, which is kind of fun. I uh, got to feel that pop when uh, when Bogdanovich got introduced for the first time. That was pretty cool. The place got real rowdy when he came in entirely too late in the first quarter because uh, Tibbs left Taj Gibson in until he was about ready to die on the floor. Uh, and then Alec Burks too, got a really nice warm reception. So that was fun. Uh, and like you said, it was kind of a mixed bag from the two. I actually thought like one started strong, finished weak, and the other one started weak, finished strong. Uh, Bogdanovich was the one that I thought started pretty strong, like looked a little, I don't want to say out of sorts, but like he was trying to figure out where he belongs on the floor, which is normal. Like he's, he's the guy that you would expect that. Uh, Cause he's never played on this team before, never played with these guys. Uh, granted, Burks hasn't played with most of these teammates because he was here all of two years ago, and yet it was, <laughs> it was it's been that long, you know, since uh, I mean, it's literally just Taj at this point. Maybe well, Deuce didn't really play his rookie year, so it's yeah, Deuce much didn't play as much. Randall, you know, like is out and Mitch is out, so yeah, I guess it's like all new guys for him, which is kind of funny to think about considering it was like, oh, you're back with your friends. Oh, wait, no, these are not your friends from before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Bogdanovich was. I thought looking for his places on offense, but I thought that he his what he brings to the floor was evident, which was spacing for one. Like he definitely is well respected on the perimeter. I love watching him play. I said this has to be. I was saying to my one friend because uh, it was my wife and I and and my friend and his wife, and I said to my friend, I was like, this has got to be maybe the slowest player I've ever seen play for the Knicks, and I kind of love it. Like he is. He plays everything in slow motion. Like even at one point when he he got the ball on the perimeter, uh, like in the corner and faked the three. And honestly, he was so nonchalant about it when he kind of like brought the ball back down that it looked like he thought that the play was over. Like I was like, did I miss a whistle? Like what just happened here? He was so nonchalant about it. And then all of a sudden just gets into a shooting motion, cans a three pointer from the corner. I was like, wow, that was really satisfying. Like it was pretty fun. Got to see him, you know, drive in a few times, you know, attack off the dribble, which he does sort of similar to uh, like how some of the other slow-mo drivers on the team do it. Like, I guess Jalen Brunson-esque, but like taller and slower, uh, where he's not really like knocking your socks off with the athleticism, but just knows where to keep the ball to keep it away from the defender and get it up and in and create space for himself in that way. So I liked 
all of the parts of his game that I knew were going to be there and liked how they translated to the Knicks. Uh, I just thought that he looked like he felt a little out of place in it, you know, to start with, which is normal for a guy in his first game with a new team. Uh, and I will say the one thing that did kind of stand out to me was I thought that he held up better on defense than I was expecting. Like he got switched into a lot of man coverage and I kept thinking like, oh man, here's where he gets exposed. Like, cause he's not really doing that much on offense. Like this is where the wheels are going to come off. And he, he did pretty well in isolation against some guys, you know, he's not a force or anything, but he kept them in front of him, which I think yeah. is about all you can ask. So maybe it was just first game boost or whatever, but all in all, I came away pretty impressed with him, even though he only had that three of 10 shooting performance. Yeah, it was it was like seven years ago, but there was there was a time where he was on the Pacers, ironically enough, trusted to guard LeBron James for a series and, and was I think the general consensus was honestly did a surprisingly good job because he does not look like someone who can give LeBron a whole lot of trouble. But but sneaky, sneaky, strong dude, six foot seven. That that shot you talked about really stood out to me because uh, Fred Katz of The Athletic had this really um, nice article after the trades. And he was asking Josh Hart, like, all right, what's it like guarding Bogdanovich? What, what makes it so difficult? He said, honestly, it's that his release is so high. And it's super quick. And I thought that shot you, you mentioned in the corner was the perfect example of it because he was open on the catch. And, and that, that's probably why you thought there was a whistle because he should have just fired right away. And, and he didn't. He brought it down. And then he's like, oh, you know what? I'm pretty open. And then just like brought it right back up high, quick release. And as a defender, like unless you put a bigger guy on him, you really have no chance of blocking that. And I think this might have been the drive you were getting at. He had that one on Halliburton where it was like totally like slow mo, but he just had the comfort of being like, you know what? I'm six foot seven. Like if, if, if you're putting a six, four, six, five guy on me i'm just going to be able to finish over him um he had all 11 of his points in the first half um i like the way he just was kind of insistent on getting to the rim when he could have just been taking a bunch of threes like had another hard drive for free throws um where, where i thought he hurt them on defense a little bit wasn't one-on-one -on -one coverage it was more so off the ball and, and granted like a, i think a pretty significant factor here was just the fact that the knicks didn't really have any kind of rim protection down sims hartenstein and mitch but he um would like rotate in the paint to tag a big and then would try to close to the corner and he just he just couldn't get there nearly fast enough to get a contest on it was usually aaron Nays Nays Nismith who made three after three after three and to be fair my my point of comparison there is og ananobi who is maybe the best in the league at like tagging the big and then getting back and and getting a block in the corner so that's not really fair but i i thought overall he held a fine on that end and then the second half um his touch was just a little off i didn't love his shot selection on some of the runners he took but also at a you go in and out like overall it was a totally fine debut and I, i'd expect a lot more next game um alec burks i almost think had higher highs and lower lows what, what did you make of him yeah i mean at first i had some some bad flashbacks like it was <laughs> it felt like 2021 20, 22 uh at, at one point in this game where i was like man taj gibson getting the courtesy start and not playing as well as the guy that comes in after him or like the guy who took over at center and pressure the when taj would say uh, that that was, you know, that gave me my first flashback. And then Alec Burks comes in and is just chucking like crazy in the beginning of his stint. And I was like, oh, no, dude, like what happened to you? Like, come on, you were at, at least a little more willing of a passer the last time around. I remember, at least I thought. And he comes in and he's just he, the first few shots. I mean, that first one he took was like that three where he just like kind of took a took a quick. I think he took like a quick little screen, if I remember correctly. All I remember is that it ended with him airmailing a three attempt into the backboard so hard that it like started a fast break for the Pacers. And I was like, dude, what was that? Like, what are you trying to do right now? I think you just had a little bit of a little bit too much excitement getting back to the garden and being back on a winning team, being back with Tibbs who really like they seem to have a great mutual respect for one another. Uh, you know, it, he settled down down the stretch a bit. I mean, there's still a little bit of questionable shot taking. The same things that were true the last time with him too are, are still true now. I think you know, like he's he can get inside, but he struggles to finish there. Uh, he he hit a couple, you know, looks on the inside, but had a couple others where you're just like, dude, that was kind of a bunny, and you just missed that. How did you screw that up? Uh, but then we'll also pull up on a drive to take a midi <laughs> because that's what he's more comfortable doing. Uh, did that a couple times, and so like those things haven't changed. But I do think, you know as we saw down the stretch of the game, there was like almost a semblance and a light outline of a fake comeback down the stretch. And he was a huge part of that because he came in and just was like, okay, I, the threes are falling now. Hit, feed me, feed me, feed me. And just kept getting the ball and kept canning threes. And that's what he's really, that's his true utility now. And 
hopefully once things settle in a little more with the, you know, the lineup shaking out better once everybody comes back healthy, once Randall and OG and Mitch come back, we're going to see more of like Brunson or Randall always being in there with the second unit kind of thing. Like, cause Tibbs was doing a pretty good job of staggering those two prior to the injuries. And then, you know, if, if it's Julius Randall, working on the inside with the bench unit with Alec Burks and uh, Josh Hart to drive and cut and whatever, and Boyan Bogdanovich and potentially like Dante DiVincenzo out there all around the perimeter. I mean, those, uh, then you're in, in really good shape, like, and Burks will be great in that role and, you know, able to kind of attack that. But for this game, it was, it was sort of a little column, a little column B. He was a little too ambitious, but then it paid off at certain times. And of course he ends up with, Probably the second most impressive uh, stat line of the day with 22 points, uh, 7 of 14 shooting, 4 7 from 3 in just 22 minutes. So that's sort of the Alec Burks experience in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I thought the box score probably overstated his impact on this one. I mean, 22 in 22 minutes is, is obviously impressive. He was he was really efficient, 7 of 14, 4 of 7 from 3. But I was with you. The, the stretch I had the most problems with was was the fourth quarter where he he just took some crap shots like it really wasn't good like and and twice twice he had Bogdanovich just wide wide open in the corner and he was forcing like runners over two or three guys and that was mystifying because Bogdanovich is the outside of Gibson is the one dude on this team he should have chemistry with and he should have immediate respect for and recognition of, of what he could do so that was that was bad to me um, some of the shot making though was was absurd. Like he had a nasty like double between the legs um three. That was his his first his first bucket of of, of the reburking. Um we, we, and, and it just kind of like I got positive flashbacks that way. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot this dude's like a hooper's hooper. And when he's going like about as fun to watch as anyone on the Knicks these last 10 years outside of the outside the true stars, like had two really tough fadeaways, one over Turner, one in the lane where he just put like a crazy high Steph Curry style arc on it. And then just got like went totally volcanic in the fourth. I thought his defense was actually probably worse than Bogdanovich's, which I think will change. But he had an inbounds where he just totally fell asleep and gave Nemhard a wide open three. And then I noticed this with with both him and Bogdanovich. Um, there were two different plays where they were supposed to have a switch with DiVincenzo, and both times, um, the Pacers ended up getting layups off it because they just didn't know who was supposed to take the big. And that is kind of the classic thing that just has to happen once or, or twice. Like when when these guys fly in a day before the game and don't get a chance to practice, they'll sit down, they'll go over film. Presumably, Tibbs will will scream in their face and, and clear that up very quickly. Um, but. Uh, worth noting, it cost the Knicks in this one. Uh, we'll come back. We'll get into Jalen Brunson's spectacular night, whether the Knicks are over taxing him. And finally, finally, a letdown game from Dante DiVincenzo. It looked pretty tired. But before we do that, Alex, uh, can we talk about our buddies over at LinkedIn? Yes, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And I don't have much hiring experience. Uh, I wish I was that important, uh, but I've never really been in the business of hiring people too much. But I have been a job seeker in the past, and I've always found that LinkedIn was the place I would go if I wanted jobs that actually made sense and that, that would actually make me say, oh, I want to apply for this job. This seems like a perfect fit rather than just like, well, I suppose I'll apply for this job. I kind of just need a job right now, so I'll try it, I guess. It, LinkedIn always is great at serving you the jobs that look good for you. And from a hiring perspective, I can only imagine that means that you're getting the absolute best candidates. And LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. And hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. And they're constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write jobs descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Gavin, we're back into 
keep talking through this game and uh, Jalen Brunson is back. That was great. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I was actually at, uh, uh, one of my favorite restaurants, one that you, uh, one that you recommended to me once upon a time beyond sushi in the city, oh, let's getting, go. getting, getting dinner before the game, you know, a little vegan sushi action. And I was the rude one sitting there the whole time <laughs> in our group of four, checking my phone like every 10 minutes being like, is Brunson playing? Is Brunson, play- is, is Brunson going to be playing today? Turns out he did end up playing. Uh, nobody thought I was rude either. You know, we all know. We're all going to a Knicks game. Made it a lot <laughs> more fun to see him play. And he ends up with 39 points in this one. Uh, only shoots one of five from three, but 14 of 25 overall. Has 10 of 10 from the free throw line. Uh, three boards, four assists. Coming back from that twisted ankle. Gavin will pop to me. Uh, it was that the three-point shot wasn't falling, and he, as he has been lately, still managed to score almost 40 points while barely hitting from three-point line, which is crazy to think about because if he had even just shot, like, if he had had a hot shooting three-point game in this, he probably hits 50 points in this game, which is mm. which is crazy. Uh, but just the damage that he's able to do lately, just working off the dribble. I mean, clearly the ankle was fine because he did so much, like, lateral crossing up of guys and just cooking guys out of their shoes in this game. And I was like, well, all right, that must've been a minor tweak. Cause you look real good today, buddy. Uh, I, I was super impressed with everything that he brought to the table as usual. And I, I thought this was as good of a way to say, welcome back as any for, for Jalen Brunson in this game. Yeah. Weirdly enough, in a game where he had 39 points and only three assists his some of his passing stood out to me almost more than anything else. Like he, he just had a beautiful, bowling ball pass to Precious on the move for, for a pick and roll dive dunk and then hit a chew again for, I can't remember if it was a dunk or a lay, but like another just pick and roll dive. And, and obviously you don't see Brunson run a lot of that. And in the past, it's been because you've had RJ Barrett and, and Julius Randle around the arc and you just don't have a lot of spacing. And I'm curious to see how often Tibbs is going to get to lineups. Like where, especially like, I think we're going to see this in the playoffs where it's Brunson and Mitch in with the bench in the lineup is something like, I don't know, but just say like Brunson, DiVincenzo, OG Bogdanovich, Mitchell Robinson. And then you actually have like three great shooters around a Brunson Mitch pick and roll or, or like, like putting Hardenstein, like a, or like a Brunson Hardenstein pick and roll. And you're actually going to get to see Brunson run it. And, and you see like, obviously Brunson is about as well-schooled and like just the nuances of every element of offensive basketball as any guard in the league. And it just because of the Knicks personnel, he's never really been able to show that off, but that was kind of interesting to me. It, it was sort of hard to tell if that's exactly why it was working today because the Knicks had Josh Hart on the floor. So there was someone you could play off of, but it just kind of got my gears turning on, on what it could look like when the Knicks are actually at full strength. And then to your point, the, the shot making was just, I mean, as, as crazy as ever, um, just a couple bully ball drives on TJ McConnell had this stretch like late second quarter where he just made three straight, like just absurdly tough runners in a row. One of them was on, on Neesmith for an and one in an all game. It was fun to watch like Neesmith has what five, six inches on him. And he was just torturing Neesmith, like put him on skates with this crossover long to look like Allen Iverson. Um, I think this might've been his second or third to last bucket of the game, but had a step through like kind of like one and a half pump high release jumper over TJ McConnell. And I thought it was a little bit of an F you to TJ because TJ was, we'll, we'll get into this later. I'm sure it was torturing deuce on the same shot, but it was sort of TJ's signature he was coming across the lane. He just shoots it like way high over his head. Um, so it was, it was a great Brunson game, Alex, but just, just no help. It felt like in the second half, he was literally the only guy who could muster any type of offense. And, and I almost wonder, I mean, with that ankle injury, it was nice for him to get an incidental game off against the Mavs, but it just sort of feels like the Knicks are putting too much on him. And you always hear with someone like Kevin Durant, like, oh, it looks effortless. Like you could you could see the effort from Brunson in this game. Yeah. And, you know, if we weren't two games away from the All-Star break and presumably, hopefully, two to three weeks away from getting this team kind of healthy again, mm-hmm. I might be like, ah, oh, yeah, this could be a little concerning. I'm not too worried about it at this moment. You know, like I, we went through this kind of last year, too, at times where Brunson will you know, he, he seems to have really sturdy ankles, I guess, because he'll turn an ankle and it just never seems to phase him for more than like a game or two. Mm-hmm. And he'll be able to come back and and just do what he's been doing. I guess that's the, the miracle of modern sports training and everything too, that he's able to just kind of recover and come back that quickly. He has from great an injury. flexibility too. I think that's part of it. Like even, even when he hurt yeah. his ankle, you can see that wasn't, that almost wasn't an unnatural motion for him, even though he literally like his butt was on his ankle. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, 
as long as he says he's good to go and this is the workload that he needs to put in, I think he's fine doing it for stretches and he won't need to do it all the time. He's about to have like two more games, assuming that he plays the next two games and, you know, there's not any setbacks that we didn't see yesterday. Uh, you know, if he plays the next two games, he gets he'll just play in the all-star game for 10 minutes or whatever, but mostly have like a week off uh, to enjoy himself and get healthy and whatever else along with the rest of his teammates. Maybe we'll get an update on Julius Randle shortly before the Knicks, uh, you know, take the floor again after the all-star break, because that'll be about two and a half weeks, I think, or maybe pushing three weeks. Might even get an OG Ananobi update then. Uh, you know, if if things are progressing there, we'll see how things are going with his elbow and all that stuff. So I'm not too worried in this, about it in the sense that, one, you shouldn't have to do this for too much longer once everybody gets healthy. Two, Burks and Bogdanovich will only get better from here. This is probably the worst we're going to see them play all year because this was like their first game getting acclimated, whatever. Bogdanovich, once he gets situated with how the team wants him to play and once – you know, once it gets a little more comfortable with where he's going to know where his teammates are and stuff like that, you'll probably see him initiate a little bit more with that bench unit sometimes because he can he can drive inside, he can kick to a cutting big, you know, in like a pick and roll, or he can kick to the corner. Like he's shown that in his time in the league. Like he averages like I think around three assists per game this year. A little something under, like yeah. that. So so you know, I, I feel good about this not being a long term issue. I think as long as the Knicks can get through these next two games. Just like knock on every bit of wood you got. I'll knock on my desk right now. No more injuries. Like then I, I think things are going to be okay. So, you know, this long term, if this continues, I would be worried about it. But as it pertains to just these next couple days or the next week or so, I'm not, I'm not really too worried about it. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, all right, let's get into the bench guys a little bit. Um, but first I got to tell everyone at home about our buddies over at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventures could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drivers and great escapes. Class ex exclusive Google built in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. But you should also check out the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. That is room for up to eight and expansive cargo capacity, advanced availability, 4x4 four four capability. With, two eight, with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. So this was the game where Dante DiVincenzo finally, I think it all caught up to him, Alex. Six game stretch where he said he was playing like someone who could be in the all-star game. And I thought throughout, you could just, you could kind of tell he just didn't totally have his legs. Like his shot this year, like I, I think the word we both keep using is is effortless. And, and again, like you could see the effort and it was short time after time after time. And I think that more than anything else, and it's, it's not Dante's fault. He's been carrying a ridiculous load that he's never had to do in his NBA career. But I think that more than anything else is what cost the Knicks in this one and, and, and kept them from having quite the firepower, Alex, to keep up with the Pacers. Yeah, I mean, I made a I made a comment to my friend while I was watching the game when Dante pulled up on the big screen. I was like, man, those cupping marks on his shoulders are getting real nasty looking. It looks like he's having Dude, to hit the They were the brown. They were like, yeah. yeah. He's having to hit the cups quite a bit right now because those joints are are screaming from all the shooting he's had to do lately. Um, yeah, it definitely seemed like I mean he was due. He was due for a game like this. You know, he's he's been carrying a huge load. And early on, he was kind of playing a little better. And then as the game wore on, he just it, it, he faded for sure. And you know, it is what it is. Like they they really needed him in this game too, because Deuce McBride looked really uncomfortable in this game, which is why he only ended up, ended up playing 10 and a half minutes. Um, Burks obviously got limited run in his first game back. Like maybe we'll see in this next game, you know, in the game against Houston that, uh, Burks will get a little more time and Dante maybe gets a little bit of time off again. Like what we were seeing sort of towards the beginning of like Dante starting when it was like Dante would play 20 to 25 and Grimes would play, you know, 20 to 25. And then you would just kind of call that your rotation. 
uh, maybe we see something more like that because I think that he could use a game or two like that. Granted, just like I said with Brunson and everyone else, like the All-Star break is right around the corner. There is a reprieve coming up soon. So I think as long as they split these next two games, you know, if you can get one win, one loss, that's fine. I think you're rolling into the All-Star break on a pretty good high, can get healthy, whatever. And DiVincenzo more than anybody needs that rest for sure. Uh, and then after the break, then he can assume a more normal minutes load and hopefully a more normal routine and more normal responsibilities because he's just like, as good as he is and as good as he's played for the last like week and change, I think we history just tells us he's not going to be able to do that forever. Um, but yeah, other than him, like Taj Gibson playing 19 minutes was really sad in this game. Man. I could, I could not get over Taj Gibson having to play that many minutes. Like I understand the Knicks didn't have Jericho Sims and that pressure to Chua was like the only other guy that they could really play at like the center, but how Tibbs watched that first half and how things went down and then didn't say, okay, the plan for the second half should probably be start Precious, bring Taj in just for like five minutes of relief to give Precious a quick breather, and mm-hmm. then let Precious close the game. I think that was more than anything probably what cost the Knicks this game because those Taj minutes were brutal, dude. I mean, he's just he's toast. He's he's old. Like he can't really play anymore. He can't move. He, he can't really stick with his man on defense anymore. And then even like the the standard like old school Taj shots that were like his calling cards a few years ago, the little baby hook in the lane, the you know all the the little little jumper on the uh, baseline, all that stuff. Everything came up short because it's just like he got more than five minutes in, he was gassed. He's like forty years old. Like what do you expect? I don't understand what Tibbs was thinking was going to happen in this game, and that resulted in you and I both noted this before the the show. We were like, oh, did you see that? I was like, yeah, yeah. The the lineup that was like. Uh, Brunson, DiVincenzo, uh, Hart, Burks, Burks, and Bogdanovich out yeah. there. So no, no center on the floor, which we know Tibbs never likes to do. But he kind of reached this point where it was like, Precious needs a rest, and I know that I can't play Taj anymore because he's he might keel over on the court. Like it was rough, man. It was. Yeah. It, I, I felt bad for him because I, you know the whole time I just kept being like, man, like this is terrible, and he's he's really costing this team on the floor right now. But there's nothing you can really do about it because. You know, is just like it, other than sub him out sooner, which Tibbs didn't do. But like, like there was no other outcome for Taj having to start a game at like forty years old on a ten day contract than what happened in this game, unfortunately. Yeah, and that that's where I mean, obviously, Divincenzo could have shot better, but this this game was was doomed from the start a little bit, and just just sort of big picture. Like, I just thought it was a bad defensive game, and obviously, one hundred twenty five points indicates that. But against the Pacers, that's in some ways a fine number. But I I almost thought like Indiana could have like pick their point like they they probably should have had something more like 140 and it's a credit to the Knicks who who I think Alex like peeled back a little on the offensive glass just to get back on defense because they're like all right Taj Gibson isn't isn't sprinting with Tyrese Halliburton and Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam um but you they they look slow and and disconnected on that side of the ball and and Gibson um for all his IQ like just just didn't really make a lick of difference and I thought Tibbs's logic was all right we just don't want to get eaten up by Siakam and by Turner on the offensive glass and the Knicks went super small like like the the point that sort of broke the camel's back was was Isaiah, Isaiah Jackson getting an and one put back and Tibbs was like all right like enough of this like I I, I personally can't stomach this and we know that's always really tough for Tom Thibodeau to sit through but it just there there weren't there wasn't a great option here and and the best one to your point probably would have been maybe just playing small from the get-go and like having pressures at center, having Bogdanovich be your power forward and, and like with Brunson, Devo and, and Hart, or if you, if you want to sub in someone for Hart, like just let them run, let them shoot a bunch of threes and, and hope kind of how the Grizzlies almost came back on the Knicks. You, you have like a once in a lifetime shooting game from someone and, 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 and you pull it out, but it, it just wasn't going to be enough. I um, mean, I think the other issues were like none of the role players really had good games unless you want to say Burks did like Precious had a great first half hit another three um showed off some quick hands defensively poking the ball away from Matherin like I mentioned those roles um but just was too small defensively like only six rebounds only three defensive rebounds in this game that's that's pretty inexcusable with 43 minutes out there on the court um Josh Hart had two really nice moments like a great lead pass to Dante DiVincenzo and had a sick like coast to coast take like weaving through the bigs but then also had a bad tack had a bad travel on a jump pass. And I just thought like, it's another one of those games where you would, you would love for him to step up and be able to create more offense. 
And it's just so hit or miss from him. And, and he was able to do so against Dallas because he was having kind of an out of body shooting experience. And, and then when that's not there, like it's it just, it's just hard for him to consistently find stuff in the half court. Like he's so opportunistic, but again, like if there is an opportunity to be taken, like he, he's not like, all right, give me the ball. I'm going to go cook. And that's like, we just have to accept that's who he is. And then Deuce um, got, got cooked by TJ McConnell, which is, I think all, all I have to say about his performance. Yeah, my uh, my distaste for TJ McConnell did not lessen. I thought at all. of you while I was watching. It's like I get it now. I He's like now. my <laughs> least one of my least favorite players. Him and Colin Sexton, man, I did mm. I dislike both those dudes. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that that one where he where Deuce like kind of was uh, he like sort of landed a little awkwardly or something, and like he looked like he was kind of like hobbled a little bit, and he was like trying to shake it off, and then mm. McConnell just came up and stole the inbounds from him. I was like. God, yeah, I hate this guy so much. Like, just let my guy catch the ball. He's hurting. He needs yeah. to shake his leg out. Come on, man. Like, ah, I mean, you know, I'm sure that's why Pacers fans probably love him. And if you were on the yeah. Knicks, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, you attack that injured point guard. You're the man. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was freaking, yeah, it was it was a rough, rough outing for Deuce. And then, yeah, I'm with you with Hart too. Like, it was it was tough to watch, man. It was like, I just think he needs one of the biggest things of the Knicks getting healthy is Tibbs needs to, once everybody's healthy again, settle back in on being comfortable with like, okay, Josh Hart is a 15 to 20 minute spark plug player. Mm -hmm. And like, like Bogdanovich needs to be getting more minutes than him. Like Burks on some nights needs to be getting more minutes than him. Like he needs to be the guy that you bring in there for energy off the bench to like push the pace and stuff really kind of like, and you know, maybe close the game here and there. Like he does bring a lot of good stuff to the team, but the tentativeness to shoot and just the overall tentativeness in general that I feel like he's showing on offense is just not helpful right now. And like without having someone like a Randall out there or even a Hartenstein, you know, that can sort of run things out of that high post and like Randall, it's usually kind of like getting the ball, starting to dribble in, draw that double, look for someone like a heart who's cutting in at full speed that can finish at the hoop. And then Hartenstein does the same thing. Usually someone will be out in the corner. Hartenstein will kind of draw the defense in a little bit and then kick to the cutter coming from the corner. Like he needs that sort of presence out there because when you have him out there and he's like being put in a position where he doesn't have that guy who's ready to like kick it to him in that scenario, it just gets real rough on offense because he's not good enough to generate coverage from three right now. Or like he hasn't been since like Miami last year. It seems like everybody has just figured him out ever since that moment and is not willing to throw any coverage at him. And then, you know, that means no attacking closeouts, no, you know, generating offense that way. And then he just kind of ends up driving into a stack defense and it's just not pretty, you know, it's it, transition is, was like the only thing that he managed to kind of get going yesterday. And that was, that was about it uh, as a result. So the half court stuff is, is really ugly with him. If, if for what, I, like if it's 80% of the time and his three, isn't really going at a good level. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. Oh, and, and I'll just say with precious, like, you talked about the the pick and roll stuff during the Brunson thing. I agree. That was really good. I mean, I hope that we see more of that from him because I think that he's got more, more pop around the rim than we realize. Like he's sort of got that OG, like effortless ability to just kind of jump off two feet and like slam at home, which, you know, is it, but like in a more compact, like big wing ish frame you know even though he plays like a center but like you know he's just got that kind of bouncy build uh different than like a hartenstein or a mitch kind of thing mm. um so i hope we see more of that out of him i thought he did okay on the defensive end obviously they got torched on the rebounds i mean now that, that's kind of the story of this game like for all the flaws that the knicks had getting out rebounded 41 to 32 against a team that was clearly superior to you on offense the way that the knicks make up for not shooting as well a lot of nights is by just out toughing the other team and they just could not do that in this game and they just especially isaiah jackson just really ripped them apart like and, yeah. and he was sort of the the straw that broke the camel's back i think also hurts when the pacers shoot 61 percent. not not a lot of rebounds available yeah. but all, offensively i mean how many the knicks finished with five offensive rebounds in this game yeah. which is un unthinkable usually yeah. right and i guess my last note too is just i don't even think that they played the worst defense in the world either like the knicks i think that the pacers just could not miss in this game too yeah. and that that'll happen some nights i mean they just there were there were a number of shots that i thought when the pacers took the shot i was like good d and then it went in and i'm like are you freaking kidding me like he closed out into his space clean he had a hand right near his right near the ball right in his face and guys are still making shots. It's just one of those nights for the Pacers and just one of those nights for the Knicks where nothing could go in. So, 
you know, it was what it was. Uh, I, they'll, they'll do better next game, I think. I think they'll play well against Houston, hopefully, and, and we'll see how things go. But, yeah, I think that's that's all I got for this one, unless you got any last notes. No, let's wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we will have you covered for Knicks Rockets, Knicks Sixers, and plenty of fun stuff coming up during the All-Star break. But until then, he's Alex. I'm Gavin. We will talk to you very, very soon on Locked on Knicks.